Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express controls and libraries. Deliver elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30 day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 498. In this episode, Scott talks with Ocean Software's Matthew Cannon about SID chips and video game soundtracks. Hi, everybody. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm talking with Matthew Cannon, uh, formerly of Ocean Software and a, you know, a legendary composer of uh, Commodore 64 music, amongst other uh, kinds of musics throughout the 80s and 90s. How are you? I'm fantastic. Good to speak to you, Scott. <laughs> so you can't stand listening to yourself either. I feel the same way. No, myself or my own music. Um, but I'm sure we'll get on just fine. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, listening back to your own music is, is, uh, it, it, I suppose it's somewhat like listening back to your own voice on your podcasts. Um, for some people, it's uncomfortable. For me, it always has been. Even when I had a piece performed live by a small orchestra, uh, many years after my video game music, uh, I was so excited for the, uh, for the occasion. But when the occasion came, I was, uh, you know, I wanted to hide. <laughs> It, it's, str- it's a strange thing. I don't know. I think a lot of artists get that uh, feeling. So how did you get started making music for video games? How does that work? Well, the question, how does it work? That used to drive me a little bit crazy when I was a kid. So starting, I don't know, probably from the age of 12, maybe 13, when I um, had uh, uh, my first home computer, which was, uh, I think, the VIC-20, and then very shortly afterwards, the Commodore 64. And that thought of, you know, how do you get started on this? That's what what drove me, really, mm-hmm. because I heard fantastic sounds coming out of the machine, uh, and I didn't have any other musical instruments in the house, really, apart from a, an old electronic organ, which didn't really work properly. Mm-hmm. And so I heard fantastic sounds coming from this machine. I couldn't believe that it was a um, a 64K machine. And I, it puzzled me. How would you make music that is so uh, detailed, involved, and, and multi-layered in this, uh, in this small box? So uh, getting started meant uh, going through some of the old manuals that you'd normally get from your... Uh, from your machine, you know, you'd unwrap the the machine, get it set up, and everything, and the the manual will be tossed into the into the box because you just want to get the video games on. That's how it was back then, you know. But um, sooner or later, the video games became so um, uh, rich in in their a- audio and visual presentation that I had to reach for the manual because I thought, well, someone must have started somewhere making such fantastic graphics, fantastic music. So I start thumbing through the manuals. And of course, the manuals don't tell you very much at all. And that's where you draw um, draw a blank, really, as a 12, 13-year-old kid. Where do you go from there? That's that's one of the hardest things to, to work out. So I started hacking into uh, into the, the running games, into the running code, using some uh, cartridges that were popular at the time, such as Freeze Frame. Uh, all completely legal stuff. You could buy these things at the high street. But the idea was that you would interrupt the running of the program, uh, do a soft reset of the machine, and then get into the machine code to work out what it was doing. So it was a way of interrupting the, the, the current state of, the, of, of the, the Commodore 64, for example, and getting into the machine code monitor and understanding the instructions. And cross-referencing with the manual, okay, so this register, this uh, this chip address is the volume, okay? So let's do a search through all of the code. Not very much of it because it's only 64K, mm-hmm. but, you know. <laughs> let's find the registers that correspond to um, sound, the sound chip, the SID chip. Uh, let's find those in the machine code that was being presented. And 
eventually through just hacking away at uh, the various registers of the SID chip, through interrupting other other games, other other people's work, uh, I was able to sort of reverse engineer some stuff. Um, and then really the, there were some commercial programs that came out around around that time as well. Uh, we had things like electro sound and uh, micro rhythm, things like that, which allowed you to make um, fairly rudimentary music on the 64. So the SID chip uh, is sound interface yeah. device. And people say that this Correct. is the chip yeah. that really made this Commodore 64 what it was. Like it was the best selling computer in history. And it was because of this, this Absolutely. chip. Yeah, there was nothing else like it. Um, the other home computers at the time really came with either a, a, a buzzer speaker, which is a very tinny speaker that's built into the machine, or something like an AY chip, which is more like a, it's like a doorbell sound, you know, that sort of square wave sound. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these machines had, had this at the time, like the ZX Spectrum and so on. And the Nintendo, I, mean, I think the Nintendo was an AY uh, uh, chip as well. Mm -hmm. but so the SID was a complete departure from that. The sound architecture of the SID was first, firstly three channel. So, um, polyphonic music was possible. Whereas with the, uh, some of the earlier machines, uh, that just wasn't, wasn't, uh, achievable. Uh, secondly, it, it was designed by, uh, as far as I'm aware, an, an engineer from Ensonic or who went on to be an uh, Ensonic engineer anyway. So a very well established, um, synthesizer. Uh, company. So when you take, for example, um, some of the analog synthesizers that were available at the time that many of our sort of 80s bands were using, like the Roland Juno 6, which is behind me here, uh, the architecture of the chip inside the machine behind me here is very similar to that of the SID. It allows you to do sawtooth, uh, pulse waveforms, noise, apply filters, and so on. So complete departure from all of the, um, the other, uh, computer computer um the home computers of the time simply because um someone somewhere decided that this machine would have to be different on audio and it's just completely different nothing like it at the time really people say though that uh the folks who designed the sid chip weren't 100 percent happy with it and that maybe it was released <laughs> unfinished yes i've heard uh similar reports um what I'm aware of, though, is is as I dug into the, the inner workings of the SID and and used some of the music routines that we developed at Ocean Software, for example, was that it was possibly released buggy. So <laughs> there were some aspects of it that that did have bugs, but we used, we started to find them and use them to our advantage. So there were things that you could do to combine waveforms that were probably not um, expected <laughs> by the original designers, but. Um, we did that anyway, and if you listen to some, there are some pieces which uh, actually demonstrate that quite, quite obviously. Because they're reliably, it's reliably buggy. It's reliably <laughs> buggy, and you know there are some of the finest synth synthesizers in the world. An example is the Yamaha CS80, which um, I've got behind me here as well. And if you play a sawtooth waveform on that machine, um, it's got a bug in it, so that the the waveform, if you play it through an oscilloscope, has a little glitch in it. Mm -hmm. Um, but that adds character, you see. That adds a certain character to that synthesizer, and now it's uh, it's a legend. And I think the C64 had all of these uh, features, um, as we sometimes call them, <laughs> in there. And they, they were. They, it was character, added character. So, yeah, we, we loved it. Absolutely loved it. And the, the, the SID sound chip has become, I mean, ordinarily you would think of it as C64 yep. sound, but the chip itself is so iconic that it's referred to as SID music. Yes, yes, it is now. Um, and nobody could be more surprised than me, really. Um, for me, music in video games was about the Commodore 64. It was never about the SID chip. In fact, I think when I started at Ocean Software, uh, back in 88, 89, I think it was, no, 88, um, the word SID really wasn't mentioned. You know, we didn't talk about what the SID registers were so much. We just knew that the certain addresses could be poked and certain things would, would happen. Uh, so the, the initials SID really didn't come up very often. It was just the Commodore 64. It makes a fantastic sound. Most of the games that we, we, uh, we publish on the C64 have great soundtracks. 
Um, so fast forward 15, 20 years later and to, to find people talking about SID music. Mm-hmm. It's quite extraordinary because, I mean, we've got, we've got SID modules now, like, um, the hard SID, which is an external, uh, rack mounted, uh, simulator of the SID, you know, with dedicated SID. And it's extraordinary. I would never have thought of, of hearing anything like mm-hmm. that. It's great. I, mean, I wish I had it. I wish I had, you know, eight SID chips, my, my C64 games. That would have been fantastic. But, uh, it was nice in, in, in a way though, to be, um, restricted by, what the SID couldn't couldn't do, you know. Um, well, and now there's online collections. There's the high voltage SID collection that's got something like forty thousand SID examples, yeah. and then there's the SID player. You can play SID music on your web pages now. Exactly. Yeah, the SID player is extraordinary, um, and just the the level of detail that the the developer of a of a an emulator will go to to emulate the certain, you know, characteristics and to play the, the ROMs through it and stuff like that. It's just, um, it takes a lot of dedication. I've thought about, uh, do my own homage to the 64 in my own way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think at some point I do want to do this. I want to, to create a, um, an IDE for, uh, SID music that's web based. So it's a web browser, uh, or digital channel based uh, app anyway. Mm-hmm. That allows you to author SID music, you know, through the browser. So, um, I'll have to do that. I must do that. It's, it's something I'm, I'm, I've had, I had on, on the back burner for a while. Well, I suspect you'll find a, because, a, an audience of volunteers though that are listening right now. Absolutely. I mean, it's going to be, isn't it going to be great? I mean, you know, to have, uh, I don't know, a fully responsive and adaptive website to play, to play SID tunes and to, to code it in such a way that, you know, very is very faithful to how we used to write our music back in the day because we used to write it byte by byte you know uh we not only had to code the the um the routines to um poke the the registers into the sid chip and to get the right frequencies and waveforms going and so on but we had to um inform the sid chip of what to play by very intricately uh, uh scribbling down every single possible note that you could have between, you know, the C and the G or whatever, and um, getting the frequencies and and lengths of, of note uh, exactly right. So it, it took a lot of uh, uh, intricate noodling, messing about, experiments, failing, and all sorts of things. It was fantastic. But, yeah, bite by bite, note by note, um, and eventually when it played back at, uh, at your 60 hertz or whatever, I think it was 50 hertz in the States, actually. I think, uh, I think the, the 64 was playing at a different rate in the, in the States. Maybe some of the music was playing faster, I think. Hmm. I'd, so I'd heard did like. you know how to write music, though, when you were doing this? Like you were saying that you were writing as, is there a generation of people who did this work who don't know how to write music? Like, absolutely, a, yeah. on, on a musical score. Yeah. But they write, correct. they know how to write the bytes, though. They know how to write the bytes. That's right. So, um, you had three channels to work with, so you had th- three chances here, really. You could either go for the monophonic sound, you know, the sort of riff, the heavy riff sound, and if you were not mus- musically oriented, then you can get away with that. You know, you could do, mm-hmm. um, you could play some very strong notes and just blare them out of the SID chip and try and get a, <laughs> get a, a, a satisfying sound, you know, and get some filters on there and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But if you're more inclined to, to writing music out and thinking about how it, it works polyphonically and all the rest of it and more, um, traditionally you know, musical, then you've got three channels to do that with. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's still the, you know, bite by bite rule. It has to go in like that. It's quite tedious, but a lot of us would put a bit of music into the 64 through our proprietary system, which is, is a absolutely crazy system. I have to tell you about, um, play a little back and then maybe scribble some down on a stave, play it on the piano, go back to the 64, maybe you know, get your feedback from the 64, what it can do, go back to the staves, scribble a few more notes, play it back, and then you just go around like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, usually only with one real musical instrument. So most of the people I worked with at the time would have just one keyboard or one electric guitar in the room and one Commodore 64 and one compiler. And it was just that going around, you know, checking it. And, uh, like I say, just maybe scoring it out. I think Rob Hubbard was very fond of scoring everything because I think he was a stage musician. He was a, uh, he was, um, 
playing with bands and he was very much a, uh, a, um, a sight reading musician. I was somewhere in between. I was studying music and very interested in scoring music in, in the right way and, and getting it, uh, in front of real musicians. But at the same time, I just enjoyed the, the, the exercise of, of, um, writing it down by hand, entering it into the compiler and firing it into the 64. It was a very satisfying thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a backup, you know, you've got a backup on the score paper just in case <laughs> you lose everything. <laughs> Who was the individual that you just referenced? Rob? Rob Hubbard. So Rob was, um, I'd have to say one of the very early pioneers in, uh, in making the SID chip do extraordinary things and play music that was very, um, sounded like real music should, like it, it intended to, to, uh, it intended to emulate real instruments or close to that, you know, to give the feel that there was a, a band playing. So there's a bass guitar playing, a bit of a drum emulation thing going on. Mm -hmm. So I think Rob Hubbard and Martin Galway at the time were the two. Uh, pioneers of the Sid chip that influenced all of us. I mean, I was only I was only a young, young boy really when mm -hmm. when Martin and, and Rob were around. Uh, but when I referred to earlier, uh, hearing the sound that was possible to come out of this uh, uh, machine that you had in the in the corner of your living room or in your bedroom, these were the guys that were that were producing that sound. Mm -hmm. So we knew they were called Rob Hubbard, Martin Galway, and uh, one or two others that that stood out. But we didn't know how they did it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, all we had was the, the Commodore 64 reference guide that you get with the machine. How would you meet these people? Could they teach you? Could you sit down with them? Could they show you how to do this? It was it was alchemy. It was complete wizardry and alchemy. It was it was it was as though it's completely out of reach to your average schoolboy who or schoolgirl who wanted to go out and play with with this uh, instrument really. Um, but yeah, pioneers. I mean, w without those guys, I don't really know what would have happened. Um, it's hard to imagine the, the Commodore and the early video game music without Rob and without Martin, really. Yeah, Rob yeah. is known for the loading sequence of Skate or Die. Ah, yes. And yeah. because of, because it had samples in it. <laughs> so there was Sid music, but then there was also the playback of samples. Yeah. And I understand correctly, the playback, the ability to play sampled audio was an, was an exploit. Of of a, of a bug in the SID that allowed that. Yeah. So um, the typical way you'd achieve that is um, is by uh, sidestepping one of the interrupts that you commonly relied on to to get the steady sound. So to to get anything running smoothly on a um, on a video playback uh, device such as a uh, a uh, Commodore 64 or a Spectrum, you, you usually tied into the raster interrupt. So this is the screen, uh, the screen writing, um, the beam, the raster beam on the television, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, that was like I say, 60 hertz. And the idea was to interrupt that at some point, um, to get a, a, a re reliable clock speed, a routine that would reliably fire. And then that would lead to you being able to write music that would, um, be consistent and be in the right time and so on and so forth. Uh, and there was an exploit in that you could, you could have the raster interrupt running and then something called a non maskable interrupt, mm -hmm. which you, you ran alongside it. And instead of sending the, uh, instructions to the, the pitch registers or the envelope registers of the SID chip, you'd send them straight to the volume registers and you'd change the, you'd switch the volume on and off so quickly that it would, you could play a sample back because really a sample is just a sequence of on uh, zeros and ones, you know, an on and an off, mm -hmm. really, uh, full volume and zero volume. So you could you could <laughs> you could simulate a, a a sample going through simultaneously. That's that's that was the, the the fantastic innovation. So Rob was doing that quite early on, and so was Martin as well. Martin was uh, doing that with I think Arkanoid was the first time he did that. Mm -hmm. So, um, brilliant stuff. Those kind of, those kind of things, we as the game, as the gamers would be, you know, playing yep. a game and then someone would hear a voice speaking or, <laughs> or, a, a, you know, music that sounded like a real sample of something. And that yeah. would be the yeah. defining moment in the game. Like, I can't believe that just Absolutely. happened. Absolutely. 
I know, and it would happen. I mean, if it happened at the, at the climax of the game as well, I mean, that was even better. I remember a game called, well, you, you probably remember, um, Impossible Mission. It was oh, a my goodness. very, yeah. And, and to, you know, there were fantastic moments in that where you'd fall down the hole and, the, uh, you know, fall into this um, bottomless pit or whatever. And there'd be a big yell, a big scream that would come out. Um, and the robots would have this sort of, uh, you know, sample playing as well. But then at the climax of the game, you meet the baddie, you mm-hmm. know, he's a Bond villain. And as you break into his his lair, he, he just shouts, no, no, like this. And it's just, to, to have that as a 13, 14-year-old kid, it's just absolutely extraordinary, yeah. you know. Another visitor. Stay a while. Stay forever. <laughs> That's it. Stuff, That's like, stuff like that absolutely b- yeah. blew our minds. And it seems it was, so silly it? now as we talk about mm. how some gamers won't play a game unless it is... Uh, you know, 60 frames a second and, uh, yeah. you know, 1080p. Uh, well, that's yeah. unacceptable. Anything less, you know. <laughs> well, isn't it strange? Because where's the room for your own imagination to fill in those gaps, right? So when you heard this Commodore 64 playing music, you knew it wasn't real music, so to speak. You knew it wasn't real uh, instruments. But your imagination filled in the blanks, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, so it's a shame, isn't it, that we've got 60 FPS uh, uh, games that, I mean, that doesn't really mean a lot to me. It doesn't. The game has to have some heart and uh, some real um, – something that shines through that you can tell the developers were, were serious about. Yeah. So simple games, really. Yeah, somehow there was a sense that there was – it was hard, you know, that, that you didn't see it. It was used sparingly. If it was easy, they would have done it through all, <laughs> all, all the games. <laughs> That's true. I mean, that was usually a memory limitation, of course, mm-hmm. um, for most of this stuff. Um Sample playback was uh, in the in the early days. I remember, um, you know, you would have uh, everything would stop and then the sample would play. <laughs> so gameplay would be suspended and the sample would uh, sound. And I mean, even even a few years later, after things like uh, Impossible Mission, when, for example, I think a colleague of mine, Jonathan Don at Ocean Software, wrote a very um, nice piece of music for uh, a game. I think it was called Run the Gauntlet on the Commodore sixty four and. Really good example of where he had a bass guitar sample playing with drum samples. Um, but you could only do that on the title screen, you know. You could never have that when your character's running around the screen or whatever, or you're shooting the aliens. You can't have that because there's no time in the, uh, in the raster to do that. <laughs> there's no processing time and there's not enough memory either. So <laughs> you play the music in the title and that's mm-hmm. it. That's all you can get. <laughs> so how long did you work for, for Ocean Software? Uh, so I worked there for about about four years in total, um, from school leaving age uh, up until ninety two. So um, yeah, as I left school, you know, I was doing the the usual sort of computer science route. I was going to university and wanted to head off into um, those kinds of things. I remember going to a college and and the the um, the guy was saying, "So what do you what do you want to do? Do you want to come to the college and and learn this this language called C?" And I said. Oh, what C? Can I have a look at some C? <laughs> and he showed me this stuff, and I thought, last week I was sat with the guys at Ocean Software, and they were showing me 6502 assembly, and there were sprites flying around the screen, and there were sounds blaring, and you know there was a joystick routine and everything, and it was it was wonderful. I, I don't know if I can come and learn C. I've seen, you know, the, the, um, Pandora's box has been opened now. I, I don't want to do that. I want to go straight into to writing, to working with the games. Um so yeah, I learned loads from from the guys at Ocean Software. So four years in total, and um, you know a lot of game titles. Um, uh, but most of all, really just learning. There was a lot of time. You know, we talk about Google time now and all this kind of thing. There was a lot of time back then, really, to innovate and to to um, try out new things. We had countless routines, countless um, five and a quarter inch floppies flying around. Um, lots of printouts as well. We used to print out our code and share it. Uh, code reviews were <laughs> done on printed out, printed out code. Um, lots of stuff like that going on. Lots of innovation that that I'm still seeing today. I'm still seeing in today's code, believe it or not. That's surprising, but it, it's true, I think. So how much has that, that that time and how you programmed and composed music on the C64 affected the music that you do today? Is it something that you still do? Are you still thinking about it on a daily basis? I, I think uh, musically... Perhaps less so than than my um, 
my current commercial programming work, which is more um, uh, oriented towards, it's more enterprise stuff, really. I think when I come into the studio, my music is, I mean, sometimes it's influenced by um, the sound, maybe, of the the, uh, the 80s uh, video game era. But, I, I mean, I after... Um, after working on the video games, I, I got more into live live performance. I think once I started to get interested in in orchestral arrangements and things like that, and study music, I started to 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 distance myself a little bit from from the uh, electronic sound. But it's in recent years, really, that I've gone back to it and started to bring out the synthesizers again. And yeah, I do I do feel there's an influence still there. Uh, I can't quite explain what it is, but it does creep in. But more so, I think in the way that I work. Um, like I say, with my um, current, present day um, programming career, uh, there there were certain things that that seemed to creep up in the consciousness as I'm working, and I remember how we did things perhaps a little bit more efficiently and with less fuss and less ceremony and less fear and less worry, and we just ex- you know we just went out and uh, and did the experiment. So um, there were fewer layers of abstraction, things. weren't there? If any, there were fewer. There, there were fewer. If you look at the uh, if you look at the code, and one of the first things that that I did when I saw the the Ocean Software Music Driver code was to introduce a layer of abstraction because I was really interested in in musical notes as they were written and as they were sounded by professional musicians. So a C sharp um, is not the the language. It's the um, a C sharp and an F sharp and an E and a, and a, and a G sharp and so on. They were not um expressed as as that in the code so that would just come through as a as a 48 or a or a 283 or something like that so um i raised the level of abstraction for my own sanity <laughs> because i i was just i'd fed up of writing notes as as numbers really so i started to to put um macros and various things into the code uh to to fully express what those notes meant. And also the, the durations. So the durations were things like 24 cycles. So 24 cycles was close to a, a, a crotchet in musical terms, played at 120 beats per minute, for example. So you'd have a semi-quaver, a quaver, and a crotchet. And a 24 would be, a, a, I think, a quaver or a crotchet. So I started to, to, um, to use symbols in the code to... Uh, to express those things because I thought they were missing. So I had a, I had a musical language that I wanted to express in the code and the language didn't have those abstractions. So we just had to make them, you know. Um, and similar things happen with the music routines as well, of course. So uh, there was no expression in, in the language of what a bar was in music. So we had to, to um, introduce that, uh, you know, a bar or a measure or a... Um, or a, a section of, of music, we, we tried to bring those abstractions into the code. It took a lot of typing, you know. There was a lot of code to go through, a lot of assembly and a lot of uh, mnemonics and all sorts of weird um, aliases and stuff. But um, we got there in the end. And, in the, you know, when, when you had the music driver the way you wanted it, you knew that the next project that demanded, you know, a high score tune or a level one tune or whatever – you could get straight in there because you could perhaps play on the piano, start in G minor or something like that, or or start with just a, a, a simple sequence, and you could go straight to the compiler and express that. Yeah, um, there are parallels in in my current day work in a way. I mean, <laughs> this is going to sound ridiculous, right? But you know, domain driven design is something that I do. You know, with 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 companies that I work on, it it's. It's nothing at all to do with music, but the way that you communicate with your your uh, SMEs, with the, the business analysts and so on, it's very important. And if you can have developers that are using a similar language and have that ability to, to, ability to be abstract and at the same time be detailed, then you get a really fantastic combination. So we were doing that back then, but in a different way, <laughs> I think. <laughs> It, it is true, though, when I think about like how long I've been doing this, and uh, the older mm. that I get, the more I'm becoming the get off my lawn person. Because <laughs> you know, I thought what we were, yeah, what I yeah, was no. doing in like the early '90s was revolutionary, but it was repeating what people had figured out in the '60s, which was repeating what pe- people figured out at Bletchley Park. I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's it's incredible, and I mean, we found some really old code as well um, in the Ocean Archives. 
and still innovation was that you know we talk about all the things that the games could do um, like scrolling multicolor scrolling multi-directional scrolling sprite multiplexing some of these ideas you know a lot of it came from arcade machines as well because a lot of these arcade machines ran on 6502 chips or um, z80 chips so you know it was already there it was you just had to know where to look but it's really hard to know who to talk to where was this information um like I said earlier, it was, it was it was really very well hidden information. You had to go and meet the hackers, meet the guys behind the um, the games. It was a very hard place to, to to start from. Really, you didn't have any any uh, example code, any frameworks, any um, you know Stack Overflow. <laughs> this is nothing, you know. It's, it, um, so yeah, I do feel the same as you. I think uh, sometimes that you know well, we've solved this problem before. I don't want to be solving this problem again. I, I'm getting a bit irritated with this, but um, but then you've got to have the patience. You know, when you're you're trying to bring this to a new uh, some new teams, for example, there's there's a time for there's a time for reflection and there's a time for you know um, just let people get on with it and make make their own mistakes and stuff like that and find out. Uh, it's good though. It's, I, I, one of my favorite things is actually working with junior developers and just letting them, letting them loose. It's fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you chatting with me today. And I want to tell folks that who understand that this show is only 30 minutes long. And Matthew and I had a great chat before the show. And we're going to do something longer and more in depth with more discussion and more music, uh, in the future. So you're going to want to watch for that. But I think, uh, as we end this episode, we will end it on the ocean loader music that, <laughs> uh, so. that you can certainly find online, but that will splice in right here. Thanks so much, Matthew. You're welcome. Thank you.